Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, this is Kurt Angle, and welcome to the Kurt Angle Show. This episode, Kurt Angle is going extreme. That's right. We're going to be discussing the WWE's version of the 2006 ECW draft and all the events surrounding it. But first, I'd like to introduce to all of you my co-host and friend, Conrad Thompson. How you doing, Conrad? I'm great, dude. Excited to be here with you. I, uh, you've probably been able to figure out from my backdrop here, I'm a huge ECW fan, so I really enjoy talking about your your one-off trip to the ECW arena. But now we're talking about a different ECW, Vince McMahon's version. What are you looking forward to talking about the most or maybe dreading talking about today the most? Well, in general, I just want to talk about the ECW. I mean, the WWE purchased the WCW a few years prior. Now they purchased ECW, and I'm ready to answer the tough questions about ECW today. Well, I'm glad you said that because we're tagging in a lot of our listeners for some help. We've got a ton of questions about ECW. Fans are fascinated by this different version of ECW. So let's get started. Um, I guess the story can't be told without saying Vince asked you for a big favor, right? You've alluded to this in a few episodes before that perhaps he had this idea or vision of let's relaunch ECW. And I think you sort of hinted around, he approached a few other guys and then eventually landed talking to you. Tell us about that. Well, Vince approached me. It was, you know, after Judgment Day pay-per-view, and he said, listen, I want to start a new company, a new promotion, and I want you to be the name and face of it. And I said, what is it? And he said, ECW. And I said, well, <laughs> uh, you know, that's that's cool, Vince, but, you know, what's in it for me? And he said, well, actually... You're going to work in smaller arenas and make less money, but I'll take care of you on the back end. And I basically said, I told you this before, Conrad, I said, why would I want to do that? Right. Work in small arenas and make less money. It doesn't make, but Vince McMahon promised what he said. And he, he backed up his promise. He did take care of me financially. You sort of handed around that maybe you weren't his first pick. Do you know who else he asked about maybe going to ECW? I don't know. I, I believe that he picked me because the ECW in the 90s had their top shooter in their company that was a name and face of the company, and that was Taz. And Vince saw me as a top shooter in the company in 2006. Right. And I know he couldn't do the things quite as risky and extreme as they did in the 90s, so Vince at least wanted to do something that was identical to the company back then. I think he was trying to make it as identical as he could up to a certain degree. Well, and you're certainly going to be the type of performer that that audience eats up. And I know some of our listeners would think, well, Kurt wasn't necessarily hardcore, but that's also a place where, you know, Ray Mysterio got for some of his first big exposure here in America and same with Chris Jericho and Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko. Uh, so I get why he would be interested in you from that standpoint. Um, you know, he's trying not to position it as a demotion, and he's saying he's going to take care of you on the back end. 
But once you've been in the, the glitz and glamour of, of being the headline act, the last match, the main event at a WrestleMania, even if the money was right, did it still kind of feel like a demotion to be working with a smaller brand and smaller arenas in theory? Well, it did at first, but Vince was so excited about the product. He, he really wanted to make this thing successful. So the more he, you know, he more explained, he explained to me and the more he talked to me, the more it made sense. It wasn't a demotion. It was just basically, you know, me being taken from SmackDown and put over to ECW. And I think that he did it to help sell the product to a network. When you're having these conversations with Vince, does Paul Heyman ever approach you and so sort of say, here's what I see for you, Kurt. We've heard behind the scenes that Paul can be almost like a cult figure. You know, he's our David Koresh, you know, he's, we're going to drink the Kool-Aid, so to speak, whatever sort of motivational speaker you want to use, maybe of a dark side. Uh, did he come to you and say, here's what I've got in mind at all, or is it strictly you and Vince? It was just strictly me and Vince at, at the beginning. And Paul Heyman chimed in later on a couple of weeks later, but he, you know, Paul never explained to me the plans he had for me. I think he wanted Vince to, you know, run the thing overall. Paul would, would run the company, but Vince would make the final decision. So I don't think Paul wanted to tell me what was going on. I think he was explaining to Vince what he wanted to do with me. Do you think that maybe you're the guy to be chosen because a, you can have a match with anybody B the hardcore fans know that you are a wrestling machine and C, if you were a fan of the original ECW, you're a big enough name and a main event talent that even a hardcore WWE fan might say, I want to give this a shot. Do you think that's why I picked you? I think all of the above. That's definitely the reasons why he picked me, without a doubt. You're right, Conrad. So tell me about your relationship with Vince, because I know that 06, it starts to get a little rocky. You've alluded to it in the past. Uh, and I think you guys were even sending text messages back and forth that at times could be unpleasant. Uh, what was your relationship like with Vince on a day-to-day -day basis in this era? Well, up until 2006, we were pretty close, but, you know, my behavior became erratic. I started, uh, you know, behaving out of control, um, you know, sending Vince text messages, threatening to beat him up. I mean, it was crazy. Um, you know, I, I had the painkiller problem that nobody knew about. I was injured so much, you know, and I, I couldn't take any time off because a lot of the other talent were injured. So a lot of top guys. So I was, you know, kind of there to keep the product intact. And, uh, you know, it just, I, mentally, I was just losing it. And I was texting Vince more and more. He wouldn't respond. So that would piss me off even more. And, uh, you know, after I joined ECW, it got even worse. So, you know, I can't help but have a follow-up question. Why were you threatening to kick Vince's ass? Because he wouldn't get back to me. I see. And, and I understand why now. I, I you know, I, I wasn't making any sense. You know, he, when I went to a meeting with Vince, when I decided to leave after, after ECW in 2006, he had a whole list of text messages. And I'm reading these and saying, gosh, I, I don't remember texting this. It was really graphic. I'm going to beat the shit out of you. Uh, you know, some of the texts didn't make sense. I was probably high on painkillers when I was sending them. It was just uh, ridiculous. And I, I was in awe. I'm looking at these texts going, holy crap, I don't remember saying any of this stuff. And uh, wow. you know, it was just a bad situation. Well, it was expected all week, uh, the week of May 29th, that an announcement would be made about the new ECW show being on the Sci-Fi channel. And um, the show is going to air on Tuesday night. Uh, Meltzer's going to think it's either at 9 or 10 when it's first uh, teased. And it's a 52-week commitment. So not only is it a new show, it's a new channel. What did you think when you heard the news that, yes, we have an ECW TV deal, but it's with the Sci-Fi Network? It was it was odd. I, we, we didn't correlate the two. We couldn't understand it. Uh, we, we th you know, I know the Sci-Fi Channel is a, a quality TV station, a quality network. They, they really are, but uh, it just wasn't the right fit. But the crazy thing was the sci-fi channel approached Vince 
and said that they wanted two alien wrestling characters on the show. And, oh, God. and Vince said no immediately. He said, we're not doing that. That's way too tacky. So I don't know if that was the pushback from the network. Uh, the reason why they were having trouble getting starting times when it would air uh, on Tuesday nights. Uh, I'm not sure if that had anything to do with it. It's amazing to me that he says, no, we're not doing that. That's tacky. Oh, by the way, meet the dead man, the undertaker. Oh, and have you seen this pirate over here? Paul Birchall, like in the scheme of things, I mean, there's even an, uh, an alien on TV now on Wednesday nights on AEW. So it's not that out there, but it is a little weird. Uh, we should also mention that the WWE had an exclusive deal with NBC universal, uh, USA network was not interested in giving a good time slot. Bravo had only expressed mild interest. So they had very little leverage, but the ECW name is hot, at least amongst wrestling fans. And uh, a lot of the reason that the deal wound up here is Bonnie hammer. And a lot of listeners to the show have heard Bonnie hammer's name talked about a lot on something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. She used to run the USA network. Well, now she's in charge of the sci-fi channel and she wants more WWE content. I know I'm asking a question here that probably isn't going to be something you can answer, but did you ever meet Bonnie hammer or hear her name? Or is that all behind the scenes stuff that the wrestlers would have never really had any contact with? I never heard the name. That is definitely all the behind the scenes, uh, talk that uh, it was discussed with just the office and Bonnie. So Nobody knew about that. It was pretty confidential, I'd imagine. I feel strongly that saving money is important. You know, if it's not something we worry about now, boy, we are really going to worry about it later. And I want to help you get out of debt faster and do it with cheaper monthly payments. I'm talking to you if you're in a 30-year loan. Now is the time to take years off of your loan. We're routinely helping our listeners cut 5, 10, even 15 years off their loan. And you can do this without perfect credit, with no money out of pocket, You've just got to start at SaveWithConrad.com. By the way, it's not just wrestling fans who think it's weird that wrestling is coming to sci-fi. Uh, sci-fi fans online, and they are a hardcore crowd, they had their own message boards and websites, and they hated the idea of pro wrestling coming to the station. But ultimately, it gets the green light because everyone agrees this will be the highest rated show on the station. So even if it is a weird station, being the number one show on a station you can't ask for much more than that right kurt no without a doubt if you if you're going to be the top rated show in your station you better keep it or at least you know sign a deal to get it on your show i or on your network uh that, that that's a win-win situation for the network it comes out that eventually it's revealed hey we're not going to necessarily be running these smaller arenas like vince had told you instead we're going to do it as a part of the smackdown tapings from a functionality standpoint of how you travel and who you room with or who you ride with or all that hearing that you're still going to be touring with the SmackDown guys. That's got to make you feel good. Right. When it comes to TV. Yes. Uh, and, and it made it, you know, more convenient to have to tape the shows uh, and, and being able to uh, travel with my friends that, you know, I usually travel with on SmackDown. It made it a lot more convenient. So that, that was a good concept for me. Let's talk about, that sort of piggyback experience because it's been common that before a raw or a SmackDown or something like that, they might type, they might tape, say a B show, something like main event, and they would record that prior to the big show. So it's not necessarily a dark match, but it is sort of the show before the show. Would you have preferred that ECW be taped before SmackDown or after? Well, it doesn't matter. You know, the, both shows were going to be taped anyway. Uh, you know, the, the ECW show could have aired live, but it's, it's being taped to go live. So there's no way you can edit because it's the same night. They're going to air it the same night. So you have no time to edit. So we're all thinking that it's basically live as is there's no safety net. So, uh, for a talent, from a talent perspective, there's no difference. Well, I just wonder as far as a, a live experience with From a fan partner, perspective, yes. it's a big difference because the night can get long and people can start sitting on their hands and you can have a situation with the crowd. But as far as the wrestlers, it didn't matter either way. Well, when you're trying to feed off of the crowd, did you have a preference in terms of getting the crowd engaged? Would you rather go on first or last? 
I'd rather go on first. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 um, you, you, when you're at the first show, the crowd's energetic and they're, they, they have a lot of energy. They're really rowdy. But, you know, when you start going into three or four hours of taped shows, uh, they start sitting on their hands. They're not responding as much. So, so obviously, I'd, I'd rather go uh, first. But, you know, the, the biggest match of the night is usually the final match. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a trade-off, but I, I would still like to go first, definitely. Meltzward, right. An interesting news story from this time indicated that a planned Chris Benoit versus Dean Malenko match for the ECW pay-per-view had been canceled. And Paul Heyman reportedly had the idea to do a Benoit versus Kurt Angle submission match. And the Observer reported that you were mad uh, when you got word in Bakersfield on May 23rd, but others felt Benoit was just as unhappy to learn that his match with his friend was next quote. Benoit had several things promised to him that hadn't been delivered. And Malenko had gone into training for his return and was taken off of the books. We're going to talk about that match coming up this summer, but I do want to know, you know, when, when you hear this, it's written that you're upset at the idea too. Were you upset because you didn't want to wrestle Benoit again? Or is it more a matter of you knew how hard Dean Malenko had been working to come back? I was more upset that Dean Malenko wouldn't be able to perform. Yeah. Um, you know, especially those two. They they were they were kind of ECW originals. Yeah. You know, they were back there in the 90s. And, you know, Chris and Dean haven't wrestled in years. And I think a lot of fans would have loved to have seen that match. I was more upset about that. I was also upset because I was banged up pretty badly. And I knew the submission match with Chris Benoit would be very intense and a very hard match, but I was willing to still do it. I was just upset that Milenko wouldn't be able to perform. That sucked. Let's talk about the 2006 brand extension draft that happened at the Tacoma dome in Tacoma, Washington on May 29th, 2006. It's pretty simple. Paul Heyman is the ECW representative, and he's going to get two draft picks from SmackDown and Raw for every new for the very newly created ECW brand. And given what happened at WrestleMania, everybody knows who the first pick is going to be. It's Rob Van Dam, and we know that he's going to go on to beat Cena for the world title a few weeks later. But then Heyman surprises everyone, and he picks you. Um, what do you remember about that night? Obviously, it's not a surprise. You've been uh, warned ahead of time. I only mention that because I think they've uh, done a lot of drafts where the talent didn't know, including Jim Ross, that he was not going to be calling Raw anymore. And now he's going to be calling SmackDown. It, but you know it's coming. But did everybody else in the locker room out that day? What was the reaction to it's really happening and we don't have Kurt, quote unquote, on SmackDown anymore? Well, I think what it did was opened up the, the situation with the boys and girls in the locker room that uh, it's not just going to be ECW talent. There's going to be mixed talent on the show. And uh, I think that when me being picked first showed that there was a chance that certain others would also be picked in the draft and they would cross over from Raw or SmackDown to ECW too. Uh, the Observer would write, the choice of angle is interesting. While SmackDown seems and is depleted with the recent short-term losses of JBL due to injury and Chris Benoit due to a number of reasons, it will also be bolstered in the next few weeks with the returns of Batista and Randy Orton, the two men who had been groomed for the past year to carry the brand. Uh, Angle's move to SmackDown was an emergency replacement for Batista. On first thought, putting Angle on ECW is a smart move. He's got cre credibility of being a major star for seven years. The company needs ratings fast because they're only on a trial run with sci-fi. Whether the brand makes it or flops will not be determined by what ECW was, but what this version can be. And it has been very clear that Rob Van Dam isn't going to be enough to carry the brand. And people like Terry Funk and Mick Foley won't be there after one night stand. That's interesting that Meltzer is going to write essentially that Rob Van Dam's peak was 2001. And at this point, the WWF has positioned him as a mid Carter who could be a star, but he's not the franchise character. Maybe he could have been fresh out of ECW in 2001. Did you feel like when they drafted Rob Van Dam as at number one and you at two, that uh, it was a slight or, Hey, they're trying to make something with this guy. I don't really need to be number one. And did you think that Rob Van Dam could be sort of the flag bearer for the brand? I thought Rob could have been the flag bearer for the brand. I think that he, he was so talented and 
pushed them pretty good. I mean, they, there were times where they didn't push them as hard and sometimes where they did. I think they utilized them when they needed to. But, you know, he wasn't consistently a top guy, main eventer. And I think that's the reason why they picked me first. Meltzer's got some other opinions here. He says, upon more thinking, this is probably the worst move possible for Angle. Angle's body has broken down badly, and ECW is being pushed as a more violent promotion, even though Paul Heyman called it a new direction of ECW. Even if Angle is in the group and kept away, he will be performing three nights per week at house shows for a far more demanding fan base, and generally speaking, working with sloppier wrestlers and those willing to take more risks. On the fourth night, he'll be on SmackDown television, and fans there will also be expecting something different than what they had already seen on the show because of the ECW moniker. Will be shortened, probably greatly, if this move isn't rescinded within a few months and he's put back to where he can take more care of himself and has performers to work with that are less likely to mess up. What do you think of that statement that maybe this audience is going to be more demanding and you'll push yourself even further. And that's probably not best for your long-term. Did you think that's somebody who didn't understand you or wrestling who wrote that or someone who had your best interest in mind? If I would have read that back then, I would have said he's crazy. Right. Looking at it from my perspective now, he was absolutely right. Right. You know, that that's what sent me over the top. And, uh, you know, I, I got injured wrestling in a ECW house show and uh, wrestling Rob Van Dam, my hamstring, my groin, and my abdominal muscle all at the same time. God. And, man. you know, looking back, you know, he was absolutely right. It was the, it was the wrong move for me, um, you know, knowing that, you know, I, knowing that the, the fans would be more demanding of me and expect me to do different stuff and I would have to do more extreme stuff, uh, th that was definitely the case. And uh, he was absolutely right at saying what he did. I know we're going to talk about your departure from the company and that injury that you suffered at that ECW house show. That was really a big part of why you wound up leaving, right? That was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. That was the last match I had in ECW and WWE in 2006. That's a, after that match is when I called the meet with Vince McMahon at the headquarters in Stamford, Connecticut. Well, let's jump into some questions because we got so many. I was really blown away at the response we got. Uh, the champion. Any plans to bring back other ECW championships to the brand like television or tag belts? I think it would have been cool to see Kurt as a triple crown winner if they had. Of course, we know it really just winds up being the world title. But do you remember there being plans that were shared with the talent of we're going to expand the roster and have all these different divisions? Well, I knew they were going to expand the roster, but they didn't talk about tag titles or television titles. It would have been pretty cool, though, to be a triple crown winner of EC. It would have had a lot of a lot of accomplishments to my list of accomplishments. So uh, it would have been a, a very proud moment for me, but uh, that was never talked about. Uh, Denovius wants to say, who was one of the ECW originals that you wanted to wrestle the most, but never got the chance to? I would say Dean Malenko. Mm. Uh, I was a big fan of Dean's uh, watching him in WCW. When he came to WWE, I was still a big fan of his. Uh, him and Chris Benoit were two of the best technicians I've ever seen. And uh, I definitely wanted to wrestle him before he retired. And it never happened. Let's, uh, let's do another one here. Wyatt wants to know, do you have any stories from the ECW Arena house show? I was in attendance. I remember the crowd was on fire for you and Rob Van Dam. Well, that's the match where I got injured. That's the, that's the main match where I, you know, tore my hamstring, my groin, my abdominal muscle. I only wrestled in a few house shows uh, for ECW before I quit. So there wasn't a lot that I did um, by, at that particular time. So I didn't spend a lot of time in ECW. I was there for, I think, a month. Uh, Chronic wants to know... Um... Your remix theme, which uh, you were used when you were, which I used when I was working out, because it's awesome. Did you get to listen to it beforehand? And if so, did you like it? Well, I listened to it beforehand. I didn't like it so much at first, but the more I listened to it, the, the catchier it got. 
I love my theme song. I love how catchy it is. Uh, it's a really cool song. It, it definitely represents who I was as a kid, and uh, I wouldn't change it. It's it's the best uh, entrance thing uh, that I could ever have thought, uh, imagine possible. Do you? I mean, it, a lot of our listeners are fascinated with the whole musical component of this. Do they ever come to you and say, "Hey, which of these do you better?" Or do they just play you? Or do they even give you an option and just say, "Hey, here's your new theme music." Well, they, they, they make a song for you and then you'll show up at the arena and they'll play it out loud in the arena and you decide if you like it or if you don't. But for the most part, they're basically saying, hey, this is the music we made for you. This is the music you're going to have to use. You can, still, you can say you don't like it. And, uh, they'll go back and re-edit it. You know, for the most part, it's going to be identical to the first one they made. Let's, uh, let's do the chronic question. Uh, cause I think he's got a follow up. We'll do his other side later. Uh, Dave wants to know, did you, or some of the other wrestlers think that getting moved to the new ECW was demotion? You've, an you've answered on your behalf. Did you talk to any other talent like Rob Van Dam, for instance, he's an ECW original. Uh, we know that he's in line for the big push. Does anybody feel like, man, I kind of been there, done that. I don't really want to do that again. I'd rather be on raw or SmackDown. I don't know. I, I think that Rob would have been excited about, it. Uh, you know, especially DCW being in the WWE, uh, you know, that for, for one, he's guaranteed a paycheck. So, yeah. you know, that, that so sometimes they didn't get him back in the nineties in ECW. So at least he knew that he was guaranteed a paycheck every week. And uh, I think Rob would have been excited about ECW starting up again. That's where he made his name and that's where, you know, he got his reputation. Did any of the characters, this is a question from Conrad and Huntsville. Did any of the qu characters from the ECW original territory, when they start to come back, um, did you have any, any interesting interactions with any of them? Like when you just see, you used to seeing Randy Orton and Batista walk around backstage and now here comes balls Mahoney. So that's, <laughs> that's a departure, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it was different. You know, those guys are different, but they, you know, they tell amazing stories and, uh, they were very intriguing, but, uh, they, they were all cool to be around. They, they were, they were great guys. They had great attitudes. I don't think ECW would have stood that long for that many years if they had bad attitudes in the locker room. I heard that their locker room had the best attitudes in the world and yep. that's why they were able to make it work. Cause everybody was agreeable with everyone. Knowing what we know now. had a fairly good run. I mean, they did last what five years. So, I mean, they, they did something right to that extent, but, um, you know, I, I, I didn't think ECW was going to last forever. I knew that it would be a shooting star and that, that star would dim out eventually, but you know, it, it was a good try. And, uh, you know, Vince was excited about starting it. And when he's excited about something, he's dead, uh, dead set on doing it. Ringside Rant Jones wants to know, were you used backstage in a coach role as well as an on-screen talent? That's an interesting question because you do have a lot of guys there who don't know how to work the quote-unquote WWE style. And I know that it's technically ECW, but ECW is owned by WWE. Did an agent or Vince or anybody come along and say, hey, Kurt, why don't you work a little bit with so-and-so, sort of take them under your wing? Does that happen at all? No, it didn't happen. I think a lot of the reason why is because Vince knew I was injured and he didn't want me getting in the ring and, you know, teaching technique to the wrestlers. Uh, but, but they never asked me to do it. I just assumed that was the reason why. Uh, Jason wants to know the WWE influx of guys that they used starting out were guys Paul had worked with before, like Kurt, Big Show, et cetera. Uh, was that Paul Heyman's idea? to just use sort of quote unquote, Paul Heyman guys. I would say yes. I don't know for sure, but Paul Heyman worked really well with big show. And I, he worked well with certain individuals and he wanted those guys on his ECW roster. And I didn't blame him. I love Paul Heyman. I, I loved his ideas, his concepts. 
Uh, he's, he's one of the best promoters in the world. Uh, you know, his, his mind, his creative mind is incredible. And uh, I've always had faith in Paul. So I knew that he would eventually pick me to be an ECW. And, and Big Show got along with him really well, too. And uh, that's the reason why they, uh, you know, moved us over to ECW, because Paul Heyman loved us. Uh, guy walks into a bar, says, would you have continued those incredible high octane matches long term if you weren't going through hard times? This is my absolute favorite version of your wrestling persona. I daydream about what ECW Kurt Angle would have been like a year down the road. What do you think? Well, the wrestling machine was my favorite character. I actually liked it better than my Olympic hero character where I did a lot of comedy and I was kind of corny and, you know, an idiot. But uh, I really enjoy doing that stuff. But the wrestling machine was more me. That's who I am. That's what I was. And uh, I, I enjoy doing it. And um, I, I loved I loved performing in those matches because it was all technical. And th that was what I was all about. You know, I, I wanted to portray myself as a wrestling machine, a wrestler in the ring that was the best wrestler in the world. And I think I did a pretty good job of that. And that's what my ECW character was about, the wrestling machine. Uh, here's one from uh, Umar. He says, uh, Kurt, what was it like backstage with the ECW renal, uh, originals like Sandman and Tommy Dreamer? Uh, Tommy Dreamer is universally beloved, so I think I know the answer to that. But Sandman, he could be a character at times. You got any good Sandman stories? No, Sandman was behaved very well. <laughs> you know, we were expecting him to do some crazy shit, but he, he was really cool. He, he didn't, he didn't do anything. He was very calm, uh, very in control, uh, that, you know, those guys are characters though. I, I met them back in the nineties and, you know, they were mostly drunk before the show even started. So, you know, they, they, they changed quite a bit when they came to WWE. Uh, Martin wants to know whose idea was it to start using a stiff headbutt during this 2006 era. I remember both uh, the Brooklyn brawler and just incredible being on the wrong end of a Glasgow kiss. And, uh, it's funny. Just incredible actually responded quote. It was a work. He barely touched me, but the headbutt spot, that is something that we hadn't seen in a long time. And you didn't just bring back any old headbutt. It wasn't an eighties Southern wrestling headbutt. This was a fighting headbutt. Whose idea was this? It was a stiff headbutt. It was my idea. I thought it would go well with the intense wrestling machine, Kurt Angle, even though it's not a wrestling move, but it is a badass move. And I thought that would help my character out by giving headbutts. And uh, I have a very hard head, so I'm not afraid to hit anybody with it. I know you were gone by the end, but Ari has a great question. He says, why do you think the ECW revival eventually failed? Do you have an opinion why it didn't work long-term? Well, the WWE tried to make it into something that it wasn't um, because they couldn't do certain things. They couldn't do the risky stuff. Uh, you know, WWE is a family-oriented show. and They're a publicly traded company. They can't do the most extreme stuff and the adult uh, content that ECW was providing in the night. So they, they weren't able to be the, the original ECW. If you're not the original ECW, there's no way you're going to work out. That's, that's my opinion. Here's another from uh, Matt. Were there any types of weapons or gimmick matches that Kurt was reluctant to use or get hit with? Was there something you didn't enjoy about the quote unquote gimmicks? I didn't want to get hit by anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a gimmick guy. Don't want to be a gimmick guy. Never used gimmicks. Didn't want them used on me. But if I did have a gimmick match, I would do it. I never turned it down. It didn't matter what it was, you know. But, you know, ECW wasn't going to be any different than WWE. Uh, you know, I might have wrestled with some little, little bit dangerous wrestlers. But uh, for the most part, you know, I knew that I would have to take a chair shot here uh, a kendo stick there, uh, there <laughs> you know, the, there are a lot of gimmicks in ECW and, you know, you have to be willing to take something, but it, it's not, it's not going to be as any worse than I would have been on raw or Smith. It's, it's hilarious the way you phrase that though, a chair shot here, a kendo stick there, here, a table, there, a ladder. Um, <laughs> Let's let's go off of that for a minute because a lot of us, you know, thankfully have never had to fall on a ladder. And I hope we 
never do. But uh, if you had to fall, if you had to work with a ladder or a table, what would you prefer? Oh, oh man. Uh, well, the, you know, the ladder is a little stiffer. The table is probably, a, a, you know, it's more, I guess, not as stiff is what I'm trying to say. So I prefer the table. Uh, the table seems a lot safer too. Chair shot or kendo stick? Kendo stick. Kendo stick stings. Chair shot can hurt. You can knock you out. <laughs> you don't know what can happen. It can break your neck like uh, Brock did with me when he hit me with a chair over the head. I think that was uh, 2003. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't like the chair shots. I would rather take a kendo stick. Uh, barbed wire or thumbtacks? Thumbtacks. Barbed wire can cut you up pretty badly. I don't mind a few tacks being stuck in my back. That's not such a bad thing. Do you remember the first time that was presented to you? Because I, I just can't help but remember as we're having this conversation, this is an amateur wrestler his whole life. So good that he won the freaking Olympics with a broken freaking neck. And now we're going to bring him a canvas bag and say, so tonight we're going to use thumbtacks. What were you thinking when they first pitched that idea to you? Thumbtacks? <laughs> I was like, holy shit. I can't believe I'm going to do this. Uh, you, you know what? It's not that bad. I, I, I was, I was nervous before I did it, but, uh, afterward it, it wasn't so bad. It's a quick pinch and it's, it's not, it's not as bad as people think it is. Uh, but you know, you, you're going to have thumbtacks stuck in you all night and you're going to have to pluck them out. But other than that, it, it's not that bad. So you said that thumbtacks weren't as bad as you thought. What was worse than you thought? Do you remember anything like that? Yeah, the announce table when I, <laughs> I hit my head on the floor. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, that was my match at uh, SummerSlam against Triple H and The Rock. And, uh, you know, the I would say the concrete floor is the stiffest thing in the world. But I, I was on the announce table when that occurred. Hunter wants to know, if you would have stayed in WWE, do you think you would have had matches with CM Punk? Without a doubt, yes. Uh, CM Punk didn't show up till after I left. But I would have loved to work with him. That kid was really talented. He could cut a promo just about as good or better than anybody. I would love to work with the kid. It, it would have been awesome. You know, that brings up a good point because I'm curious, when you're on the main roster and you're on TV every week and you're making shows, are you keeping up with what's happening on the quote-unquote independence at all? Or is that something that's not really in your purview? It wasn't on our radar. You know, we're, we're so in tune to what we're doing and we're working almost every day of the week. Uh, it's really hard to catch up on independent wrestling or other promotions. I mean, you know, I, I remember when I started in WWE, we were, we were watching WCW backstage, you know, because of the wars. Uh, but other than that, we, you know, we, we didn't have time to really uh, follow the independent circuit to see who the next up and coming wrestlers were going to be. So we, we wouldn't really know who it was. Did you hear about anybody coming in ECW where maybe you weren't paying attention, but some of the other guys in the back would say, oh man, I hear so-and-so might be coming in and you won't believe this guy. And they just sort of say whatever. What was their buzz about who could be potentially coming in that you recall? No, I don't recall of anybody that was upset or, or excited about anybody that was going to come in to join ECW. So that, that wasn't really discussed. I know you weren't there very long. And we talked about it at the very beginning when you're told that you're going to ECW, it's just you and Vince. It's not necessarily you and Heyman, but did you ever get one of those uh, famous Heyman speeches at all? Well, Paul talked to me before I went out the first night in ECW. Uh, I believe it was, it was a TV and I couldn't remember where it was. And he said, I, there's a reason I picked you number one. You go out and you, you do what you do best. You wrestle. That's what I brought you on to do. And that's what he said to me. Uh, here's a, a good one from Greg. Had you stayed longer in the WWE in 06, do you know what the plan was for you in ECW? Well, I know the plan was to get me the ECW world title uh, by the end of the year. Of course, that never happened because I quit by August. So, uh, you know, I, I never got to see it come to fruition. Uh, Jack wants to know, were you looking forward to a supposed lighter schedule in ECW? 
I knew it wasn't going to be a lighter schedule. I knew it was going to be the same schedule. It was going to be four or five days a week, shows, four or five shows a week. And uh, just like Raw and SmackDown, uh, I knew that I might have to do some extreme matches. But other than that, there was no difference. Uh, here's one from um, Rosso Porco. He says, uh, what was your favorite match during the ECW era? The ECW era, right? So we're talking just yep. ECW wrestlers, or are we talking That's right. that era? Like the we'll, era we'll, we'll go like May, May to August, you know, in that, that brief okay. ECW, WWE ECW run. I would say when my one night stand match against Randy Orton. Randy was awesome to work with. He was really young at the time, but um, you know, he was still very well posed and uh, you know, we had a great match. It was really awesome. Is there a, an ECW original you enjoyed matches with? Most of our listeners don't count Randy as an ECW performer, of course. Do you have another, like, did you have a good match with Van Damme you enjoyed or Sandman yes, or Tommy yes. or Sabu? I, I had some great matches with RVD. I wrestled him at a few house shows. Uh, the, the one in particular that I got injured, that was an awesome match. That, it was near the end when I, when I got injured. But we were able to put on a good 25-minute performance, and it was an awesome match. I believe it was in uh, New York, upstate New York. It is interesting to, to look back at this era and think about what a different time it was in wrestling. You know, at that point, ECW's been down for five years. WCW's been down for five years, and they're just trying to create whatever sort of nostalgia they can for the Monday Night War. And they even bring back some of these ECW originals. Um, Sergio wants to know how well did the originals get along with you and the other talent? You sort of alluded to that earlier that they were all cool guys. Do you remember there being sort of a styles clash with anyone else though, where for whatever reason, so-and-so didn't get along with such and such? No, there was no problem in the, in the locker room. The guys and girls were cool. Everybody got along. It, it was a, a harmonic locker room that all worked together really well. No problems at all, period. Which is surprising. I mean, considering, you know, you're going to have a lot of egos in there and uh, a lot of ECW originals that, you know, wa wanted it to be still original and no WWE wrestlers, but it wasn't like that. Everybody got along. Kellen brings up a great question. He wants to know, considering the unfortunate situation you had at the ECW arena before, this was before you are even in the WWE, but everybody remembers they did the, uh, ill-advised crucifixion angle. You weren't comfortable with it. You walked out. That felt like the end of you in pro wrestling. We've talked about it in the archives. Go check it out. Uh, but now you're working back with Paul Heyman in a more direct manner. And of course you had done that uh, prior to this in the WWE, but now that it feels like it's got his creative stamp on it, did you have any concerns about what the content might be or that you could trust him? Because you sort of alluded to earlier uh, in one earlier episode that you felt like when Paul came to you and said, oh, I didn't know they were going to do that in regards to the crucifixion angle. I think the phrase you used was he was full of shit. <laughs> did, did you think that Paul Heyman was, was somebody you could trust at this point? Or was that just water under the bridge? It was water under the bridge, but I also wanted to make sure that whatever Paul Heyman did, Vince had to approve for. So I knew that, you know, Vince, um, you know, running Paul Heyman, who was running the promotion, Vince was still the boss and he was going to make the final decision. I trusted Paul because I trusted Vince. So I think that, you know, Vince being the, the head honcho uh, of the whole situation made me feel more at ease. So chat me up about... Um the end point, you know, it feels like when Vince comes to you and he says, Hey, I'm launching this new brand. I want you to be the face of it. Uh, and you're concerned about money. And he, he, he calms that fear. It feels like he might say, this isn't forever. I just need to get this thing up and running. We're going to have you here for six months or a year or 18 months or by WrestleMania. We'll have you back. Is there an endpoint discussed with Vince, or do you think just for the foreseeable future, this is it? I just think that he never discussed anything of the length period of time or anything like that. He just wanted me to be the name and face of ECW. 
And I, I figured it was going to run as long as ECW ran. So, you know, I, I was willing to do it. I just, you know, at the time I needed a lot of rest. I needed uh, to be at home to nurse my injuries and I couldn't afford to go there because they just started a new promotion and a bunch of guys on the SmackDown and Raw roster were injured. So I didn't have any time to really heal. I had to continue on until somebody could replace me. Uh, Gil Boldberg wants to know, was fully injured when you attacked him on Raw after it was announced you were going to ECW? Based on your demeanor coming to the ring, it looked like a shoot. Okay, I'm sure it wasn't a shoot, but what do you remember about that night and working with Foley? Foley at this point was not necessarily super active in the ring. Uh, he would come back here and there, but he is somebody you probably wanted to be a little more careful with. He's not on a touring brand at the time. He's not uh, callous to taking bumps four or five days a week. What do you remember about that interaction with Foley when you announced that you're going to ECW? Well, I, I just remember, you know, laying Mick out and, uh, you know, there, you know, Mick, he, he was a guy that would tell you, listen, I'll do whatever you want me to do. So uh, he was willing to do whatever had to be done that night. He would have taken a suplex from the top rope. He would have, he would have, uh, he would have uh, jumped off a ladder. Mick Foley will do anything, anytime. And that's how he is. That's the kind of guy he is. He's willing to put his body on the line, no matter how banged up he is, or if he's not banged up, he's going to do it regardless. And I knew that about Mick and, you know, he, we taught, we talked about what we wanted to do that night and he was cool with it. We can't talk about your experience in ECW without talking about, uh, Alan Jackson. Uh, his comment is, do you find it ironic that RVD had his title stripped for weed when so much of the roster was on drugs or steroids? Do you know what the plans were long time for long term for RVD as champion? So let's attack those one at a time. You said earlier, I felt like I was going to be ECW world champion. Did you assume that would be with a pay-per-view match with Rob Van Dam? I didn't know. Uh, you know, I, I knew that Rob was going to win the title and you know, I, I, I probably would eventually have beaten him. I don't know where they were going to go with it because I think that at the time we were both baby faces, but um, I, I didn't really know when I would win the title. I just knew it was being talked about. Now let's talk about the drug component. Uh, and you've been open and honest about your struggles with painkillers. Even earlier in this same show, there was a um, fair or not there, there was a, a sort of understood in the business that ECW was a little more liberal with their drug policy or lack thereof. Did you see a different lifestyle with those guys? Unfortunately, so many of them like uh, Axel and um, of course, balls Mahoney we've lost from drug overdoses. Did, was it apparent that other guys were really struggling with their substance abuse in the ECW locker room? I didn't see a lot of substance abuse. You know, I think that Rob, getting hit for marijuana, you know, it kind of sucks because, you know, now, nowadays marijuana is legal. No big deal. Picked. But, you know, back then it was a big issue and it's one of the big no-nos that you weren't allowed to do. You weren't allowed to take drugs and you weren't allowed to take steroids. And Rob wasn't the only one that got titles stripped from him or got suspended. Yeah. I got suspended because I failed a drug test. If you're going to fail a drug test, whether it's marijuana, painkillers, steroids, it doesn't matter what it is. You, you're going to have the company's going to do something. They're going to suspend you or fine you or both. And with Rob, they decide to strip the title from him and they probably find him. But you know, that that's a chance you take when you're going to smoke weed. And I'm saying this, you know, today you can smoke weed where just about anywhere you want to, but back then you couldn't. So that, that was one of the topics of this, uh, you know, the discussion was, should weed be a, a, a drug that is illegal? And back then it really was. You know, uh, weed is obviously being decided by the, the different states. You know, you know, it's ever evolving. Just recently in Alabama, it was, um, I think it's official now that it's, it's okay for medical use. And that's, of course, the first step based on what we've seen in California and other places. But uh, my question to you is in regards to a derivative of that. That's an Eric Bischoff word. <laughs> CBD. Is that something that you have found useful in your recovery? Or is that something that is really not on your radar? 
I've tried CBD. It, it, it works. The cream works on my joints every for a good hour. Uh, it doesn't last really long. But, um, you know, it is effective if you want to get a workout in uh, so you're not sore before you start training. But, uh, you know, it, it that doesn't do anything long term for me. So I, I wasn't that excited about it. it. You know, it is what it is. I think uh, it does reduce swelling temporarily. And, and that, that's a good thing. And I, I think if you want to use CBD, go ahead and use it. It's, it's a pretty safe product. Do you know what the WWE's marijuana policy is now? Uh, obviously you don't, I mean, you're not there today, but I mean, before the pandemic, when you're still touring and it's legal in so many States here in America, but it is still sort of a gray area. Uh, had the WWE, as far as you know, sort of loosened up on their marijuana policy, just based on it becoming legal in so many States. Well, I think that the WWE what they are doing right now, and I don't know if it's changed since I left, but they would just find the wrestler. So you're going to get drug tested seven times a year. If you're going to fail seven times a year, and this is one of the wrestlers, one of, this is what I heard one of the wrestlers said, and I might as well say who it is, Randy Orton uh, <laughs> and, and, and Rob, Rob Van Dam. Um, they basically told the company that um, – they would, uh, what's, what, how much are the fines and how many drug tests will I do this year? So they wanted to pay the money up front. That's hilarious. So I think the fine was $2,000. So they just said, here, take 14 grand. I'm good. <laughs> so they, they would bypass the tests and they wouldn't get suspended. So I think in marijuana, they've been uh, lighter on about because it's not banned anymore. You don't get suspended, but you still get fined. You know, I know some people are going to take issue with that and say it's a workaround, but I think marijuana is the one drug where it's like, man, if it's legal in, you know, a large portion of the country, it kind of is what it is, especially if you're touring and you're in those states and you're doing what's legal, you know, for years it's been legal in Nevada. And if the WWE ran a show in Nevada and guys went and had dinner and then afterwards had an edible and a few beers, I don't see how they could get in trouble. They should not get in trouble for that. In my opinion, like it's legal here. I'm not breaking any laws and I don't know. That's probably I totally agree. If it's legal in that state and you're doing it that night, it should be fine. You, you know, if, if you get drug tested that week, you should say, well, I was in Nevada. Yeah. Smoked some weed when I was there. And uh, so I, I shouldn't be fined or suspended. I agree with you because it was a legal process you, you right. did you did do it in a legal state so i don't see why uh marijuana is even an issue today it should be it should be done no more no more fining no more suspending i totally agree i'm curious i know you weren't watching wrestling back then but did, did any of the old timers ever tell you about the uh the hacksaw jim duggan iron chic marijuana arrest back in the day that brought so much shame to the wwf is that when Iron Sheik uh, stuffed something in Hacksaw's uh, bag or something? I, you know, there there's a good guy a and a bad guy, and they get pulled over, and they had marijuana in the car, so they were quote unquote breaking kayfabe, and they had marijuana in the car, and they're supposed to be, you know, heroes to children, so they can sell dolls, and it was it was a black eye, and so for a lot of time, I think people thought that will be on the list forever, and then here it pops up again, but this time it's not, you know. Uh, a baby face and a heel so much as it has the world champion. He, he, and, and so that gets headlines everywhere, you know, in this clickbait society we live in, if you can, you know, arrest the WWE champion with a drug charge, that's going to get headlines everywhere. Oh, without a doubt, that would definitely get headlines. And I, I didn't know about Hacksaw Jim Duggan and uh, RG getting stopped and they were smoking marijuana and they were baby face and hill didn't they they had a program together at the time right yeah so you know at the arena <laughs> we hate each other we're iran versus america but then hey let's go get a dupe and make the next town so uh shouldn't have done that for a variety of reasons uh, let's do matthew spanks he says uh we know you didn't want to go to ecw and you said you would do whatever vince wanted you to do um what what led you to that just having ultimate trust in Vince. Uh, a lot of guys sort of put their foot down and say, I, you know, that doesn't work for me, brother. But that doesn't seem like that was really even in your vocabulary. But it's happening, in a, it's happening at a time where 
you're really breaking down. You're frustrated with Vince. You're sending rude or angry or upset text messages, whatever, you know, descriptor you want to use. But then when he asks you, Hey, will you do it? You just agree. Um, is this just because you're so all over the place and you're behaving erratically or is it one thing to have that conversation with Vince on the phone, but then in person, man, he just charms the pants off of you. Well, Vince was a father figure to me. So I, I, I would do whatever he asked me to do it. I had full trust in him. It's just at the time, uh, you know, I wasn't able to get, get a hold of him because of my erratic behavior. And I think Vince was dodging me on purpose to, to teach me a lesson. You know what? I was mad when he asked me, you know, he said, listen, I, I want you to be the name and face of a new promotion. And I'm like, what's the promotion? He's like ECW. And I was like, why? You know, I, I, I didn't know why. And he was like, well, uh, let me warn you too. You're going to make less money work some work in small arenas. I said, well, I'm not going to do that, Vince. Why would I want to do that? So I was giving him attitude that day, but he persuaded me. He kept talking to me and he kind of co coerced me, coerced me into agreeing with him. So Vince does have a psychology when he meets with guys and he makes you feel good about the decision he just made for you. Vince is really good at that. He's a great talker. Let's um, let's talk about the ECW crowd for a moment. They're some of the most, especially the, you know, back in the day, the most hardcore fans around. Um, they made you know things like, uh, boy, this is not something I ever thought I'd say on a podcast. Show your tits a chant, and they made uh, you fucked up a chant. They chant everything, and it's sometimes not that polite. Uh, did you ever get some of those chants in one of your matches and think, wait a minute, what the hell's going on? <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, for some reason, the ECW crowd loved Kurt Angle, the wrestling machine. Um, I didn't have any problems. I, I guess I never fucked up or, <laughs> or missed the spot while I was wrestling for ECW. So I didn't get to hear those, but I heard that they're pretty rowdy. They're very passionate fans. And, uh, you know, I remember when I wrestled Randy, they were chanting the whole night. They were on fire. It was just, uh, you know, it was a different breed of a crowd. It was, it was pretty awesome. Well, you, you can't fuck up if you go to uh, physicallyfit.com. That's pretty awesome, especially if you use our promo. Code ready. Pod. Look at you, man. Didn't have to turn or nothing. Bam. There it is. The sweet barbecue. Uh, you know, Jim Ross and I were just talking about this the other day. I didn't know this, but Jim's got some chicken snacks. He used the promo code angle pod. He got 20% off the whole order. And I said, Jim, what are you doing? Kurt would have sent you yours for free. Uh, right. But at home, you can get yours right now for 20% off at physicallyfit.com. Now, what you'll do is click where to buy, and you'll see right there that you can have stores near you. I've got one just two miles from my house, but I still opt to have it delivered because I want the 20% off. So if you click buy online, you'll see all the different flavors and you don't just have chicken snacks. You've got a plant protein. Tell them about it, Kurt. That is snack smart. It's our organic plant protein. It's the same, uh, flavors as chicken snacks. It's just organic plant protein. So we have two options for you. You can order them at physicallyfit.com. Use promo code angle code angle code 20 and you get 20% off your entire order, no matter how much or how little you order. That's exactly right. That promo code again is angle pod and you'll get 20% off your entire order. You can get physically fit snack smart. Uh, you're talking brown sugar cinnamon with pretzels. You're talking honey mustard with pretzel pieces, sour cream and onion with bagel pieces and rice sticks, or your favorite Kurt, a spicy Buffalo and blue cheese. And I think you actually prefer the chicken snack version. And you were telling us before that has the most protein and the least sugar. Is that right? It has, it has the most protein. All of them have uh, close to the same amount of protein, but some of them have a few more carbohydrates in it. Cause we add some pretzel uh, bites and, you know, peanuts and stuff. Um, but, but the, the Buffalo wild, wild Buffalo and blue cheese is just strictly uh, the chicken snacks. So there's nothing added in it. So it's a lot cleaner protein. Less carbs. Yeah. By the way, though, if you want a snack for the kids, 
Can we recommend the cinnamon swirl hard uh, enough? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Orton loves it. Your kids love it. Mrs. Angle likes it. Everybody loves cinnamon swirl. Yeah, my kids absolutely love it. My wife does too. They're they're they taste like cinnamon toast crunch cereal, and uh, they also have pretzel bits inside of them too. It's flying off the shelves right now, and you need to try it to see why. Kung Pao, Sriracha, Sweet Barbecue, Cinnamon Swirl, Jalapeno Ranch, Pizza, Buffalo Wing. There's something for everybody. It's physicallyfit.com, and uh, don't forget to use that promo code ANGLEPOT. Get 20% off. Kurt, I just looked at the site. There's a couple of flavors sold out. Business must be good over at physicallyfit.com. Yes, but we're we're having a hard time manufacturing right now. So we were sold out of a couple of different items and we're not able to be get them made for a couple of weeks. So uh, the, the orders were a bit surprising. We got a lot more orders than we expected to, but we'll be back on track by the end of this week and we'll have more um, product in store in our storage. So we'll be able to send them out to you regardless whether you order today or not. So by the time you hear this, it's there, but I guess what I'm getting at is we want to thank you guys for supporting this. The best way to support our show is to go to physicallyfit.com and pick up some chicken snacks. I want to be clear. We do have great sponsors here on their show and we want you to support all of them, but this isn't just a sponsor. This is Kurt Angle's company. And so the best way to support us is to support chicken snacks and pick it up at physicallyfit.com. Use that promo code AnglePod. get 20% off your entire order. And I want to mention too, the list price is only $9.99. So when you get your 20% discount, it's eight bucks, but there's seven servings per bag. So it's not like you're running in the gas station and you're getting a single serve snack or a bag of peanuts that you can down right fast. This is a big bag with seven servings, right, Kurt? Yeah, seven servings. Uh, every bag has seven servings and uh, it's relatively cheap. The, the $9.99 is relatively cheap for seven servings especially when you get 20% off. Come on. You're talking like a buck a serving. You can't get that deal anywhere else. Check it out right now. Physicallyfit.com. Angle Pod gets you 20% off. I also want to mention KurtAnglebrand.com is your hookup. If you're looking for Kurt Angle t-shirts or video messages or birthday cards or autograph collectibles, not just eight by tens, but birthday cards for the special wrestling fan in your life. How about a cowboy hat or a milk carton? But maybe my favorite thing, because not everybody does this, there is a special autograph request button over at Kurt Angle, KurtAnglebrand.com. And if you have an old title belt or an old picture of you and Kurt, you'll actually sign it for him, right, Kurt? Yes, I'll sign it for a small donation, send it to the address on the website, and I'll get it back to you. I want to mention, too, we've got a very special episode coming up next week. I can't believe it's finally here. When you and I first started doing the pod, I knew that I wanted to do this, but I wanted to do it on David's birthday. Next week is Mr. David Schultz's birthday. And if you don't know the full fox catcher story or who David was to Kurt Angle, you need to tune in next week. It's going to be a total departure from what we've been doing. And listen, even if you're just, quote unquote, just a pro wrestling fan, you don't want to miss this. I think it's one of the most fascinating stories in all of sports. There's been multiple movies and documentaries and specials about it. But Kurt's going to tell his story in long form right here next week. Give the fans an idea of who Mr. Schultz was to you in real life, Kurt. Dave Schultz was a friend, a mentor, and a coach. He was the best wrestler I've ever known. Uh, he was a world champion, Olympic gold medalist, a couple-time NCAA champion. And he learned eight languages in eight different countries so he could learn technique from wrestlers throughout the world. He was the best technician in the world, and he was the best coach in the world. I'm telling you, you don't want to miss this. So even if you think, ah, he wasn't a pro wrestler, I don't want to hear it. This is a story that you won't believe. And you can hear it in Kurt's own words next week, right here on the Kurt Angle Show. And in two weeks, we're doing something I can't wait for. We're going to do a watch along your street fight with Shane McMahon from King of the Ring 2001. This has got to be one of the most talked about matches of your entire career, right, Kurt? It's what everybody talks about when they bring up my career. The first thing they say is, you and Shane McMahon, King of the Ring 2001 street fight, that was awesome. And they're right. It, it was an awesome match, and I want to talk in further detail about it. I want to explain today why it was so awesome, but you will find out if you watch the episode of the Kurt Angle Show. Check it out. You get these shows early and ad-free over at adfreeshows.com, and you get the video that's adfreeshows.com. And I want to mention, we're doing a watch-along of that match. 
And I don't think Kurt has ever done alternate commentary on the entire match. It's going to happen right here in just two weeks. Uh, if you want to interact with the show or you've got a question about that match, find us on Twitter. It's at the angle pod. And you can ask a question right there about the match with Shane and the street fight. Uh, the rest of the month of June looks really strong too. We're going to talk about one night stand of six, which we alluded to earlier. Uh, Kurt believes that's his very best match he had in ECW and what a hostile environment it was in front of. We'll also talk about Randy Orton. And uh, of course, as, as we roll into the month of July, we're going to do something pretty fun. The debut of the cowboy hats from July 5th, 2001. We're going to watch an old Monday night raw with Kurt. I, I enjoy watching wrestling with you. Kurt. <laughs> These watch alongs are going to be a lot of fun. They are a lot of fun. We did one already and it was a blast. I had so much fun doing it. It was a lot of fun with you, Conrad. Well, stay tuned, boys and girls. The best is yet to come. We've got more interviews coming your way and some very special stuff. We've got big plans that we don't want to tease just yet, but uh, we're getting next week started with a big special celebration. We're talking about the life and times of Mr. David Schultz and the uh, impact he had on Kurt's life is immeasurable. Stay tuned next week right here to the Kurt Angle Show. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.